Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Rob. Today's video is going to be on VPLS. I've already taken the time to configure OSPF. Uh, so the topology that you're about to see in a second uh, will already have OSPF adjacencies formed with the other provider routers as well as LDP neighbors because I've already configured uh, MPLS as well. Before I begin, this is going to be building off of just a uh, regular pseudo wire like point to point so if you're familiar with xconnect uh then this video is going to be perfect for you if you're not uh i would really urge you to uh go back and uh maybe take a look at that sort of thing because i don't think v understanding vpls will be uh very easy if you don't uh if you don't have the fundamental concepts so I would urge you to go back and read up on that, uh, do some labs, and then maybe come back to this when you're ready to learn uh, how VPLS works. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, jump over here to GNS3 and I'll uh, give you an overview of everything and show you how to configure it. Looking at the topology over here, you will see that we have Customer 1 Edge 1, Customer 1 Edge 2, and Customer 1 Edge 3. Uh, I've also taken the time to have a little bit of fun with this and make up some uh, cities. So uh, this is uh, going to be in LA. Uh, edge 2 will be in Chicago, and uh, Edge 3 will be in New York. We uh, already have OSPF neighbors between CSR or CSR1, CSR2, CSR1, CSR3, CSR3, and CSR2, uh, and uh, LDP neighbors as well. So OSPF is up and running. The loopbacks have been thrown into OSPF, and we have LDP neighbors. So I took care of all that stuff at the beginning because I wanted the, the, the main focus of this video to be on the VPLS configuration. There's really nothing advanced about the configuration that I've already done. It's just very, very basic OSPF peering, throwing those loopbacks in there, and then using the MPLS LDP auto config command under the OSPF process. So with that being said, uh, CSR1 knows how to get to 2.2.2.2 on CSR2 uh, and 3.3.3.3 on CSR3 and so on and so forth. Now, the goal of this, uh, when we're finished configuring VPLS, is to have C1E1 or LA, the LA branch office, Chicago branch office and the New York branch office all communicating, not just communicating over routed links, like you communicate with things over the internet, but communicating at layer two. So if we were to send an, uh, an IPCMP echo from the New York branch office router over here to the LA branch office router, we would actually have an ARC cache entry in here that resolved the layer two address of the LA branch routers gig zero slash two interface. Let's go ahead and open up our console into uh, CSR1. And uh, also, I wanted to make mention if anybody wants to lab this at home, uh, you will need either a Cisco ASR router or the Cisco uh, Cloud Services Router 1000V virtual appliance that you can run in uh, either GNS3 or EVNG. So we have the console open for CSR1. Jump into global config and open up gig two. I'm gonna do a no shut just in case it's shut down. And we'll start with our service instance. I'm gonna call it uh, service instance 10. And of course, can't forget ethernet. In order to classify that, we'll say encapsulation dot one q 10. So what that means is that this service instance is looking for a VLAN tag or an 802.1q tag of 10. Now, this at this point doesn't work like a regular sub interface or a trunk interface where we're, we're saying, hey, we want to tag this. It's simply there for classification purposes. So with this in here, 
That leaves the responsibility up to C1E1 to make sure that we have a subinterface that will tag this traffic with uh, an 802.1Q tag of 10. So with that being said, that brings me to the next command, which is going to be rewrite ingress tag uh, pop one symmetric. Okay, so what this means is is that, like I just mentioned, this doesn't function as a as a uh, regular uh, sub interface that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. So we actually have to tell this what we want to do. If we want to manipulate the tag, if we want to rewrite the tag or change the tag, we need to tell the service instance specifically that we want to do that. So if we say rewrite ingress, that means that packets arriving ingress on gig two which would be assigned to service instance 10, since we have this tag here that it's looking for, we want to pop the tag. So if we look at the options, we see pop one, pop two. So uh, pop one, we're just dealing with one tag right now, Q and Q, uh, that would be different. You can manipulate it uh, based on that if that is uh, what is happening. So. We're going to pop the tag on the ingress, and it's going to then have an MPLS label applied to it, and that tag of 10 will be gone as it tra uh, traverses through the provider core. Now, symmetric means essentially do the opposite on egress. So when the packet is being forwarded egress from this interface, instead of popping it, it will push the tag. So we have, again, encapsulation.1q10, uh, it will push that tag back on, so that way this router will have the tag that it's expecting. Okay, so we'll do a do show run interface gig two. And that is the configuration, very basic configuration. Uh, service instance 10 ethernet, encapsulation.1q, we're looking for that tag and we want to pop it on the ingress and push it on the egress. I'm going to jump around as I do uh, these blocks of configuration. So essentially we're doing the same thing on CSR2. So interface gig two, no shut, service instance 10, ethernet, encapsulation.1q, oops, encapsulation.1q10 rewrite ingress tag pop one symmetric whoops having a hard time uh, typing <laughs> all right last but not least uh, we'll do the same thing on CSR3 interface gig 2 service instance 10 Keep forgetting Ethernet. Capsulation.1Q10 rewrite ingress tag pop one symmetric. Uh, and then let me make sure I did it. No shutdown. Okay. So that takes care of the first part of the configuration. Uh, so we'll jump back over to CSR1. And the next step is to create the pseudo wires. So again, if you're familiar with XConnect, uh, you're more than likely going to be familiar with uh, doing something like this. Say interface gig 2, XConnect, and then say 2.2.2.2. Uh, the VC would say 10, and then encapsulation and PLS. So we are going to do it a little bit different, and that involves creating a pseudo wire interface. And the naming convention I'm going, or the, should I say the numbering convention I'm going to use is, uh, I'll say pseudo wire 12 between CSR1 and CSR2, uh, pseudo wire 13 between CSR1 and CSR3, and so on and so forth. So that way I can keep things straight. So we'll say interface pseudo wire. 12 encapsulation MPLS and then we just simply type in the neighbor command so neighbor will be uh, since this is between CR, CSR1 and CSR2 
the loopback, since we're using the loopback, loopbacks to uh, 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 terminate these pseudo wires, CSR2's loopback is 2.2.2.2. And like I mentioned before, we already threw this into OSPF. So every router knows how to get to every other router's loopback. So we'll say neighbor 2.2.2.2. And we will give this a uh, virtual circuit ID of 10. We'll move on to pseudo wire 13 between CSR1 and CSR3. Once again, in cap MPLS, neighbor, and the loopback of CSR3 is 3.3.3.3. We'll use. Uh, um, oh! <laughs> Yep, uh, I totally, uh, I totally botched that by uh, going right back into pseudo wire uh, twelve. Make sure I didn't make anything, any drastic changes there. Oh, and I, I can't. Uh, trying to get it to come up with the. Uh, Oh, okay. Uh, that's weird. I don't know if I had exist an existing configuration on this router. I may have. Either way, this looks right. So, yeah, interface pseudo wire 12 between CSR 1 and 2. Neighbor is going to be 2.2.2.2 .2 .2 .2 .2 with the VC ID or virtual circuit ID of 10. And then interface pseudo wire 13. Uh, yeah, encapsulation on PLS, neighbor 3.3.3.3. So that looks correct. So let's move on to CSR2 and do the same thing. So we'll have different uh, pseudo wire interface numbers. Uh, so 21 between CSR2 and 1. Encapsulation on PLS, neighbor 1.1.1.1. Virtual circuit 10. Interface pseudo wire. 23 between CSR 2 and 3 and cap MPLS neighbor 3.3.3.3 virtual circuit ID 10 and back over to CSR 3 interface pseudo wire uh, we'll do 31 between CSR 3 and 1 and cap MPLS neighbor 1.1.1.1 Virtual circuit ID of 10, and then interface pseudo wire 32, in cap MPLS neighbor 2.2.2.2 with a virtual circuit ID of 10. Okay, the next step is to tie the pseudo wires together with a VFI, which is a virtual forwarding instance. The way we do that is. And there is, there is an older way. I believe it is a legacy method, but we could do layer two VFI. We are going to use the layer two VPN VFI context command uh, with this. So we'll say layer two VPN um, VFI context and just uh, we'll say 10. Same thing with the VPN ID. I'm just trying to keep everything tied together. We started using 10 with the uh, 802.1Q tag. So to keep things as straight and as easy to remember as possible, we'll just keep using 10. All right, so VPN ID 10. So that's when you create the VFI, the command is layer two VPN v VFI context and then a name. And then you need to, before you can do anything else, you need to assign a VPN ID, which we chose 10. What we do now is just add in the pseudo wire. So member pseudo wire, and since this is CSR1, we'll say member pseudo wire 12 and member pseudo wire 13. And that's all you have to do there. So uh, that's pretty simple. Layer 2 VPN VFI context 10, VPN ID 10, and add the pseudo wires in there. We'll move over to CSR2 and do the same thing. So layer two VPN VFI context 10. And we'll put our VPN ID in there, which will also be 10. And we will say member 
pseudowire, and we have pseudowires 21 between CSR 2 and 1, and 23 between CSR 2 and 3. So member pseudowire 21, member pseudowire 23. All right, then I'll move over to CSR3, layer 2, VPN, VFI, context 10, VPN ID 10, member pseudowire 31, member pseudowire 32. Okay, so we just tied the uh, pseudowires together uh, under a VFI or a virtual forwarding instance. The last step, and this is where the magic happens, this is uh, where the MAC address learning happens. Uh, which makes this point-to-multi-point -point, uh, layer 2 VPN setup possible. We'll create a bridge domain, and the, bridge, the purpose of the bridge domain is, again, to learn the MAC addresses, but the way we do that is, is tying the VFI, the VFI we just created on every single uh, CSR, where we tied the pseudo wires to the VFI, so we tie the VFI to the bridge domain and then the interface along with the service instance under that bridge domain. And I'll give you an example right now. So we'll say bridge domain and again we're just going to stick with 10 since that's what we've been using the whole time for everything else. So I'll say bridge domain 10 member VFI 10 member and then remember we configured gig 2 service instance 10 looking for that 802.1q tag of 10 so we'll say member gigabit ethernet 2 service instance 10 so at this point CSR1 actually has a, a uh, complete uh, configuration for v VPLS to work now of course VPLS is not going to work because we still have to do we have to do the same thing on CSR2, same thing on CSR3. But just to give you an idea here ahead of time, I'll issue the do show bridge domain 10 command. And we see that we have our VFI 10, our neighbor of 2.2.2.2, virtual circuit ID of 10, and same thing with neighbor 3.3.3.3. Under here, we're going to see where uh, the MAC addresses that we learn over these virtual circuits, and they will be learned on a pseudo port. And to give you an example of that, let's open up C1E1 right now. And again, we're not going to have full reachability because we haven't configured CSR2 or CSR3 yet with the bridge domain, but if I go into C1E1's gig02 interface. So I'll go interface gig02, no shut. And since we're looking for a tag of 10, I'll go gig interface 0 slash 2 dot 10, encapsulation dot 1q10, so that way I can give it an IP address. And we'll give it a class C uh, private address. So IP address 192.168. 1.1 slash 24. And the only reason I'm jumping ahead and doing this right now is because I want to show you how this will automatically learn the MAC address. And just like that. You see we have MAC address 0C27 FC875A02 on pseudo port gigabit ethernet 2 ethernet flow point 10. So we learned that MAC address just like that. And if I would have configured the bridge domains on CSR2 and CSR3 at this point, we would also see that we have learned the same MAC address, not through gigabit ethernet 2, but through the pseudo wire. And you, you'll see that because I'll issue this command again at the end of the configuration uh, after I finish configuring these bridge domains. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump over to CSR2 and say bridge domain 10, member VFI 10, member gigabit ethernet 2, service instance 10, and CSR3, 
Bridge Domain 10 member, VFI 10 member, Gigabit Ethernet to Service Instance 10. And also, um, let me complete the configuration for C1E2 and C1E3, which is essentially uh, just like with C1E1, we're just assigning an IP address to that subinterface and, and uh, applying that 802.1Q tag. So let's open, uh, let's console into uh, the Chicago branch office over here, just C1E2. And just like over in LA with C1E1, we'll hop over to gig0 slash 2, do a no shut, create that sub interface. So interface gig0 slash 2.10, encapsulation.1 Q10, IP address, and we will say this is going to be 192.168.1.2 slash 24. All right, so let's hop over to New York's C1E3 router and same exact thing gig uh, 0 slash 2 no shutdown create the sub interface and uh, just to make note if we uh, if so in the uh, CSR routers so let's go over here to CSR 1 do a do show do show run interface gig 2 uh, if we would have if we would have said encapsulation default instead of dot one q10 then we wouldn't have to worry about sub interfaces uh, on the uh, branch office routers so we're specifically looking for that tag therefore we need to create the sub interfaces to apply the appropriate 802.1q tag so encapsulation dot one q10 ip address and we'll say this one is going to be 192.168.1.3. Okay, so at this point, uh, the configuration should be complete on everything. And we should have full reachability between LA, Chicago, and New York. So let's go ahead and jump back over to LA's C1E1 router. And uh, let's try to ping, ping sh Chicago. So we'll go do ping 192.168.1.2. Should wait. Uh, there should be an ARP, and then we have success. Now the cool thing is, if I go do show ARP, we see here that this resolved the layer two address. So, like I said at the beginning, we're not. This isn't layer three MPLS where you're actually uh, peering with the uh, provider and running a routing protocol and their router is your first hop. No, we actually resolved, at layer two, we resolved the MAC address of this edge router over here in Chicago over this uh, layer three MPLS network. How cool is that? So let's try to reach uh, New York down there at the bottom. Success. Do show ARP. And there we go. And just to uh, show you with 100% certainty, let's uh, keep an eye on this MAC address. Let's open up uh, C1E3. So I'll say do show interface gig uh, two. I'm sorry, uh, gig zero slash two. And uh, yeah, so the burned in address so we have 0C27, FC700502, and there you go. So that is a very basic uh, VPLS configuration. I want to do one last thing before I end this video, and that is I want to uh, test OSPF over, uh, over this Layer 2 VPN. Uh, so that would be... One of the benefits of utilizing uh, Layer 2 MPLS versus Layer 3 is like I just mentioned a few minutes ago, instead of peering directly with the uh, PE routers, 
and them, t them taking your routing protocol and redistributing it into uh, MPBGP and dealing with multiple VRFs and stuff like that, you're not peering with the provider at all. You're peering with your edge routers at your other branch office locations. So if I were to open up C1E1, go router OSPF1, it's bare bones OSPF configuration, uh, jump over to gig 0 slash 2 dot 10, IP OSPF1, area 0. Just firing up OSPF on that interface and on C1E2 as well. And then uh, C1E3. So router OSPF1, interface gig 0 slash 2 at 10. IP OSPF1, area 0. And C1E3. Router OSPF1. Interface gig 0 slash 2.10. IP OSPF1, area 0. Okay, so let me bring all of these over here so you can see. It might take a moment since this whole topology is virtualized. But we should start forming adjacencies with our other uh, branch locations. Let me just go do show IP OSPF neighbors. Okay, so things are in motion. We say two. We see two-way uh, druther or designated router other. Um, in this instance, since we have three, that shouldn't be like that. That should change. And we also see this one is also stuck in exchange start. Uh, it should, it's, okay, and there we go. Perfect, all right. So we're forming adjacent, I think we uh, formed adjacencies with uh, all of our branch locations already. So do show IP OSPF neighbor. All right, so on C1E1, we have a neighbor of 192.168.1.2 which is C1E2, or the Chicago branch office, uh, which is a uh, backup designated router, 192.168.1.3, over there in New York, which is the DR, designated router. Uh, we'll jump over here, do show IP OSPF neighbors. Well, I put interface in there. <laughs> and boom, all right, so we have two OSPF adjacencies here as well, and I assume we will have two OSPF adjacencies over here at the New York New York location as well, and we do. See, the, there you go. We're we're peering with all of the routers at our other branch locations over layer two, like it's a multi-access network. The same thing as if we have all of those routers plugged into a, a just a big giant Ethernet switch. But it's not, it's going over a layer layer three MPLS fabric, which is the provider core, but yet we have this, we still have this layer two network, which I think is so cool. So with that being said, one last thing, let me just create a loop back on C1E1 to simulate some sort of network uh, behind this router. And I'll just say it's going to be 10.10.10.10 slash 32 and throw it into OSPF. So IP OSPF one, area zero. And now when we go over here to C1E2 in Chicago and I go do show IP route OSPF, we have a route for our 10.10.10.10 network via 192.168.1.1. Can we ping it? Yes, we can. And the same thing over here, over at C1E3. Do show IP route, OSPF, and there's our 10.10.10 .10 .10 network. Do ping 10.10.10.10, and we have full reachability. And that is it. 
So I'm going to end this video here, and I really hope that this was a help. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. You can leave a comment in the comment section below, or you can contact me via email. Uh, you can send me an email to rob at rmtechcentral.com, or you can visit the website, www.rmtechcentral.com, click the contact button on the upper right, and fill out the contact form. I wanted to thank you for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.